By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And this is part number two in the Singleton series where I discuss decks with Brian Weissman and also commentate on a match. And in part two, we're going to look at the match. And in part one, in case you've missed it, uh, you can click on the link that's appearing right now. And in part one, we extensively discuss both of these decks and we ramble about Singleton and some other stuff. So if you're interested into that and you missed that video, you can click on the info card and that'll take you back to part one. It's quite interesting. And um, in part two, so this part, we're actually going to look at the match itself. And we've got Julian, uh, who's on a mono black singleton deck, and he's taking on Sebastian, and he's on a black and white singleton deck. So that's what we're going to look at. And this match was played in, last year, I believe, in November. So let's go to the match. Okay, so we're seeing Sebastian sitting here on the left. And his opponent, Julian, sitting on the right. It looks like uh, Julian just picked up his first seven. And we've got Sebastian now taking his first seven. Yep. And let's see if these players are going to keep their hands. I would expect at least one mulligan, given given the, uh, the high variance of the mana in the format. They're both checking out their hands here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were right. Oh, you know, both two players. <laughs> two mulligans. <laughs> Not too surprising, <laughs> honestly. Um, I have found, actually, that, that the format is so slow that um, it actually is pretty forgiving of mulligans. And, of course, if you if you remember back to the, the original old school era, um, back when I played original old school in literally early 1993, or I'm sorry, early 1994, the mulligan rule was all lands, no lands. So Exactly. Yeah, yeah it was definitely, um, I mean, this is, Pre Pro Tour, pre Paris Mulligan, and obviously pre London Mulligan. So, you did have a sizable portion of games where one guy would have to keep a one land hand, and uh, it was pretty much over on turn one. So at least, so they, at, yeah, at least they get a modern, player. a modern, an old format with a modern Mulligan rule. So you can still, I believe they're they're playing with the London Mulligan, draw seven, and then uh, put put whatever yeah. number of Mulligan cards back on the bottom of your deck. Definitely, this is such a weird. Weird shuffling thing that they're doing. Are you familiar with this weird shuffling thing that they're doing? Yeah, I think they're they're saying okay, put uh, stack number one on stack number three, for example. So they're they're telling you how to stack up your cards. Weird. So it's more. I guess it's then more random. I guess so. I mean, I guess this is this is a way to sort of add a degree of accountability for playing online where you don't have the ability to shuffle your opponent's deck so this is sort of a quasi a quasi exactly. version of that <laughs> it's kind of creative mm -hmm. actually i, I kind of like that idea since it's the closest thing you can get to um it's definitely the closest thing you can get to actually shuffling your opponent's deck having some degree of agency over it all right so redrawing new hands i am in a way i am su well surprise is a big word but you would expect the mono black player to maybe take less mulligans just because his deck is more consistent, he doesn't need, you know, he only plays with one color. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. I mean, I think that that's talking about sort of a larger issue with the format. And this is something I definitely noticed when I was playing um, the first deck that I built, is that so many of the games just come down to mana. That that, that factor, so it looks like they're both keeping here, that factor really pushes people in the direction of wanting to play monocolor. Okay, so we've got here Sebastian off with his basic planes Mishra's factory here. Yeah, opening with a factory. So Sebastian's in this position where I'm sure he's looking at a hand with a whole bunch of things that cost double white and double black. And it's really, it's just awkward because do you play a swamp second, preventing yourself from playing a thing on turn two? Or do you play a planes? And that means you can't cast a double black spell. Okay, he's playing Maze of wow, Wow, look at this Maze of If. Does that mean that he doesn't have any other lands in his hands? I, I suspect that that was a play just as a... Uh, he thought for a while. I think he does have land. I think he just put that out as a way to prevent himself from taking two damage. It's one of the things that you can do in the format because it's so slow. You know your opponent isn't just going to be... Uh, all right, so he's got Chaos Orb on turn two, Universal Answer, and along with the Strip Mine. I think he did have the Strip Mine. I think he was considering whether or not to use it. And I think he played the Maze just to save himself, too, because obviously he doesn't have a um, doesn't have a Plowshares in hand or a Disenchant or a Divine Offering for the Factory. 
Kumbosh Witches comes down on the right side, that card that we were talking about in the Universal Pinger. So Sebastian's got his white and his black. And now he's just kind of hanging out, waiting to draw one of the other colors. And this is a sort of situation where a sinkhole or a, or a strip mine from Julian could be quite decisive. Interesting that yeah, he's, I mean, uh, he's, so he's going in there now, in. animating his factory, 40 attack, probably going to be sent back here by factory yep. taking a damage which is kind of nice actually because that actually gives him the mana back effectively it it, it gives him a, a rebate of one mana so he can actually play a land and cast a spell for three but it doesn't look like he has anything i can't really tell what that is next to the factory I think it's a desert that he just oh it's played. desert okay yeah i didn't recognize it yeah so julian's found double white still missing double black and doesn't currently have anything to do but i mean his deck is is pretty much just primarily reactive anyway so he's not going to be really pushing the board for a while. And here they come again. Doing the same thing, taking a damage. Yeah, from still the taking witches. a damage. Why do you think he's opting not to use the strip mine on the factory? I think that's a good question. I mean, he's got some other non-basics in his deck. So maybe, yeah, maybe he's afraid of a maze. That he wants to use it on a maze later on. Yeah, I think that that's a, I think that's a reasonable conclusion. I can go back and look at the... He doesn't play with a maze, but maybe he thinks that yeah, he might... Yeah, because I, I think that they actually had access to each other's deck list. It doesn't look like uh, Julian does have a maze of it in his deck, but maybe um, just holding on to it for for something else, um, figuring it's worthwhile to take one point of damage. It, obviously, the fact is, is that Julian has quite a few expensive spells in his deck. I'm sorry, um, uh, Sebastian does. And if he cuts off one quarter of his mana... And now he's got five, right? And that gives him access to a lot of those... Yeah, exactly. Out. So he's probably holding something fairly expensive. He does have five cards in hand, I think. And uh, using the strip mine to prevent one point of damage a turn and potentially cutting off his ability to play stuff for multiple turns is is a, a reasonable conclusion. Now it looks like he's found all of his colors, double black and double white. And I think, what are we at, on around turn six or turn seven of the game? So not too bad, actually. Especially considering the mulligan that he was able to, format, man. to find those. <laughs> yeah. Go veteran bodyguard. Yeah, I was going to say, I expect a five drop here. Oh, it's Wrath. Oh, it's a Wrath of God. So what do you think about the decision to Wrath right there with uh, with only really two two creatures in play? I, I wouldn't have done it. Yeah, I uh, that feels that feels early to me, particularly because he does have the strip mine to stop the factory. He has the maze to stop the uh, the frozen shade, and that's only if his opponent even invests mana in it, which means there's a high likelihood that his opponent is not going to even be uh, pumping the frozen shade at all, and and might actually just try to develop the board a little further, and then he can actually catch another creature with the wrath of God because it, it is a singleton format. So uh, Julian certainly knows that there's only one wrath of God that he has to contend with. It's not like his opponent has two or three of them just waiting in hand. I wonder what maybe something else is in his hand, like a big creature that he's going to play out now that he felt like I'm going to wipe the board clean. Okay, there's a him. Yeah, him to Torak. Yeah, that's actually a very, very good point. If he's thinking about playing one of his larger guys, like maybe a Sarah, then he wants to clear the board first with the Wrath of God and get it out of his hand since the opportunity to use it. But it's pretty likely that his opponent has at least some kind of removal in hand. Four cards in fairly late in the game, and Julian uh, and Sebastian hasn't even played anything yet. So I would be, be surprised if some removal gets knocked out of his hand right here. We shall see. That's Oubliette. That's removal. And a swamp. And a swamp, okay. Yeah, so you definitely got one removal spell. Not too surprising. And if and we're looking at Sebastian, he still has got how many cards there? Four? I think that's three or four, yeah. And four, uh, yeah. Julian currently at three. Still has the ability to attack here, although we may see a use of the Chaos Orb at this point to prevent some damage. But he still has Strip Mine and Maze, so still has the board pretty much under control. That, that audio device was added thing, I think, is on. It's not my screen. It's theirs. You see that in the corner there? Yeah, I, I see that too. Yeah, yeah so definitely. it's from them. Okay, so <laughs> fact, Factory and Vampire coming in. I think Sebastian contemplating taking two or strip money decides to take two. Definitely I wish... Very, very, very disciplined I, with the strip yeah. mine. Sorry? Very disciplined with the strip mine there. Very much so, yeah. yeah. So I really wonder what's in his hand. Because I think that could be the only reason why he wants to keep five. Yeah, well, he has Triskelion at six. He doesn't have a ton of high-end stuff. So I, I, I got to figure he's probably got Triskelion in his hand right now, and he just really wants to get the six mana. Because if he plays happen. the Triskelion, it gives him the ability to just block the factory all day. Ah, there's Veteran Bodyguard, just as you described it. 
interesting. Nice. But he could have played it earlier. He could have played it earlier, but that would have prevented him from having the ability, I guess, to, to activate the Chaos Orb in an emergency. But he is playing against a mono-black opponent, so there's no worry of having it shattered or disenchanted. His opponent, the, the yeah, only way his opponent can stop Chaos Orb is with the, <laughs> the Gate to Phyrexia, which isn't really the best the best tactic against it. That would be funny. I And I think maybe he top-decked the him to Turek and then decided to play the him first, which makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that does totally make sense. It's really neat, actually, here to see just how powerful the veteran bodyguard really is. It's not a card you really see played ever. Oh, <laughs> perfect counter to it, right? It only wow. works. It only works when it's untapped. So I actually just wanted to ask you, like, doesn't it only work when? But that's true. Okay, so yeah, wow. it's it's, it's, it's similar to um, um, it's sort of similar. There's a lot of cards that kind of worked on an interaction of being tapped versus untapped. If you think about the card org. That, uh, that big creature from Fallen Empires. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, when I was playing against um, Sebastian in our game, I I completely forgot about the fact that Org required you to have an untapped creature with power three or greater to prevent it from attacking. And I attacked him with my Jade Statue, thinking I could just activate the Jade Statue to prevent Org from attacking. And he started to attack with the Org, and I said, oh, I'll just activate the statue. And he goes, no, 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 it, it needs to be untapped. And he was he was such a bro, he let me take it back. <laughs> so I, I saved myself That's six cool. damage. That's cool. Uh, I basically very, said, well, it's usually in old school, people are quite relaxed. And this is nice display, right? Tapping the maze. Yeah, I love that. I love that play, actually. Open. Yes, exactly. Although, unfortunately, unfortunately, the veteran bodyguard's got five health, so it can still soak up all the damage from the vampire unless he's able to... Um, does, uh, does Julian have Bad Moon in his list? Let's take a look here. I'm actually expecting Julian to maybe now use the Icy to tap the bodyguard and deal some damage. Yeah, that's yeah, what's Yeah, he could, but that, that, that gives... Um, that gives Sebastian the ability to kill it with the Chaos Orb if he needs to, although obviously the flip is not deterministic. Um, but you're, you're right, he did exactly that play. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, there's Swords of Pasha, So I would, I would maybe use the Chaos Orb on the Icy. Yeah, although... I think, well, I think so. The, but the Chaos Orb is so universally useful. It can deal with something like um, potentially uh, game-breaking like Pestilence or Underworld Dreams. Yeah. And yeah, um, so we only the... want to use it basically when he's really forced to use it. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's... It's you don't have any recursion in this format the way that you do in old school where you've got usually regrowth and recall and stuff and sometimes time mm -hmm. twister is a way to get your chaos orb back. He does have our Gibeon archaeologist at least, which is a combo that I ran as well. But um, I think what Sebastian's probably thinking is is that he has uh, multiple ways to deal with icy in the form of both disenchant and divine offering, and um, the chaos orb is just maximum flexibility. So unless unless it's absolutely mandatory that he needs to use the Chaos Orb to kill something off because it's, you know, beating him in the face for four damage, killing it in a roundabout way is probably better. You know, if you consider that Swords to Plowshares kills only creatures, Chaos Orb kills everything, it's better to probably just use that. Plus, getting the Vampire off the board with Swords allows him to actually start attacking, and that's exactly what he's doing here. And uh, you'll notice we're threatening to uh, potentially strip mine the, the factory away if... Um, if, if Julian elects to activate it to try to make it a 3-3 to block the Knights yeah, of Thorn. Or, or maybe he attacked in a band. Oh, he right? must have, yeah. We, I, we, we have no I, audio, so of course he is banding. attacking in a band. For those who, for, <laughs> for people out there who um, who don't know how banding works, you want to explain it to them? I, I assume you're quite familiar with it, because there's probably some people watching the video who may not even know how banding functions. Well, if, 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 you, if a creature is banding, when it attacks, it can band with one other creature. Or if the creature also has banding, then you can add another creature on top of that. So if the bodyguard would have had banding, you can band with the bodyguard and with another creature that doesn't have banding. In this case, the bodyguard didn't have banding, so it could band with the Knight of Thorn because it have, has banding. But you cannot band with more than that um, when you attack. Can you still follow what I'm saying? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm listening perfectly. Go, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and then when this you weird block, little, like window that just popped up here for some weird, reason. Yeah, this is the weird thing. When you block with banding, you can actually, if you have one creature with banding, you can choose to block with all your creatures, and you can block it in one big band, and you can uh, decide how the damage is being um, divided over the creatures. Yep. So that is, that is quite interesting. Yeah, it's very funny. The, the fact that it took you roughly a minute or so to explain the mechanic is one of the reasons why banding was, I think, retired something like 20 years ago, <laughs> although... It was a very, a very bad explanation, by the way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's fine. I mean, basically, I, I, I've always described banding as sort of like creature glue, that every creature with banding can glue itself to a non-bander, and the creatures essentially fuse together into one thing. And um, the one thing that's a really big deal is that banding 
and, and I think this contributed to the fact that banding was retired, was the fact that not only was it very confusing and not particularly intuitive, but it made games just in, grind on interminably because it, it's incredibly biased towards the person who's blocking if they have one banding creature because they can effectively distribute all of the damage of the creatures they're blocking through all of their guys. And so a single banding creature on, your, on defense uh, for your opponent can often mean that you can't attack with anything for the entire game because they have one banding guy. And it it just, sounds like you have played with Fallen Empires. I've played with every, every, form, every card ever, uh, ever printed. I mean, I, I played on uh, the Pro Tour back when banding was a thing. <laughs> and when entire dra wow. draft or seal decks built around the banding mechanic were extremely strong. Oh, Hymn to Torx. This is probably a Disenchant or Divine Offering coming. Yeah, there's the disenchant. That's going to take down. So, what do you think you should kill, the icy or the Jalem tome? I would go for the icy. I just, yeah, it but looks that's like also is, personal. I think the icy is so versatile. It is. It is so powerful. And Spirit Link's gone. This is a really interesting game right here. Kind of both in a stalemate. Both guys out of cards. But the fact that um, the fact that Sebastian has uh, has a banding creature in play should allow him to continue to press for damage. Although we may actually finally see the chaos or <laughs> there's another guess this popped up. Um, <laughs> we just get these random cameos from people. Um, we may see we may see the chaos orb used here, I think, um, probably to take out Jalen Tom because um, with his opponents still holding cards, I think Sebastian's gonna see uh, Ju uh, Julian pull well ahead in terms of card quality using that card if he um, it's just going to allow him to cycle through all of his lands really rapidly. Oh, there's an anime dead. Anime and dead what is he bringing back? Yeah, you... excellent. Yeah, now that thing is a serious creature. <laughs> Forget what I said about Chaos Orb on, uh, on Jalem Tome. It may have a new target. But there's a lot of glare on the card. Can you see what creature it is? Yeah, it's Frozen Shade. Uh, it's Frozen Shade. Uh, of course, he's got tons of swamps. Tons of swamps. It looks like he has six black in play. So the creature's got minus one power, meaning that it can get as big as five five attack big enough to kill the bodyguard which is really critical it's really that's actually really shifts the balance of power in favor of uh, of julian although um sebastian's got a couple of answers still sitting in play oh and he's tearing probably the veteran bodyguard yeah would have been neat to see terror actually during the attack step so for example imagine if Imagine if Sebastian attacks with the band with Knights of Thorn and the veteran bodyguard. Yeah. And yeah. Julian yeah. activates his factory, blocks the band. Oh, there's Gate to Phyrexia. Oh, no, it's Demonic Tutor. Wow, what a, what a top deck that was. Holy cow. Um, wow. That's yeah, he, uh, he activates, now, but he activates his factory, makes it a 3-3, blocks the band, and then tears away the veteran bodyguard, leaving just the Knights of Thorn fighting the 3-3 factory, which would have been an awesome two-for-one. I think it may have been a little bit a little bit uh, early to cast the terror there, given the fact that um, Sebastian already showed that he was willing to attack in a band with those two guys. So what do you think he should get? There's a lot of... Uh, let's bring up his deck list here. I felt... Well, he, he played the terror in response of the strip mine on the factory, right? So he kind of felt that he wanted to use that mana yeah. as efficiently as possible. That was interesting. What do you, what do you think uh, he should get? Here's his deck list right now. What would be your choice? Let's... I'm looking at his deck list now as well. Oh man, that's tough. Uh, let's look at the board again. Mm. Does he have more or less mana than his opponent? Lantex could be a thing. Lantex would be interesting. I think he does actually have, uh, it looks like he has seven. Oh, eight. Of he's, got, he's got Maze of it, so he actually has more land. Are giving archaeologists, of course, because he has a chaos orb. Oh yes, but. that's a great choice. That'd be really cool to see if he gets that actually, because that would give, that would really give his. Oh, he jammed a tome. Yeah, I was. That, that was another card that I was considering, because um, his opponent being mono black is just a lot less likely to draw an answer to the tome, and the tome will sort of make true. a victory inevitable. Yeah. I think I really like the archaeologist play as well. I think that with with archaeologist orb, if his opponent doesn't find an answer in literally two turns, the game is probably just over because he can kill the jailum tome, kill the frozen shade. And then just basically have free reign blowing up all of um, all of Julian's lands. Yeah, exactly. And his hand is empty, and he just played the terror. Oh, we get another guest in. Yeah, another guest. That's <laughs> hey, another that, guest. that said. <laughs> we just get all these cameos. <laughs> um, that that said, if um, if Sebastian were to um, play Jam, Jam Day Tome, he may very well just draw into. Uh, draw into one of the other cards relatively quickly. He could just draw the Archaeologist in a few turns, too. So he's probably just banking on that. The fact that the Tome is probably the safer play. I think it's less of a, of a play-to-win play, but I think it's safer. 
and I, I definitely think it's a great choice. It would have, it would have, based on this list right here, I think it would have been probably in my top two to three cards to choose. Other choices, I think, would have been something like um, the Serpent Generator actually would have been a decent card to get right now, as it could uh, pretty quickly overwhelm his opponent, and uh, maybe something like Taunus's Coffin. But I think it's probably Archaeologist or Tome. And now, um, yeah, Julian's in a pretty tough spot. You never want to be just saying, draw a card, go, when your opponent plays a Jam Day Tome. We've all been there plenty of times in old school, and we all know how it feels. Let's see, is he going to activate it in his main? Looks like it. Yeah, he's just got four land just sitting there. Yeah, I think we're on, uh, Julian is activating the Jalem Tome right now. I think I kind of agree with you what you said earlier of using the Chaos Orb on the Tome because the Tome is the only thing that kind of can get him back into... I totally agree. Into the yeah, I think this is the perfect time to do it, to be honest. You've already used Disenchant. You have Archaeologists left in your deck, and that leaves you really with just Gate to Phyrexia and and uh, the Divine Offering as a way to get rid of Jalen Tome. Why is yeah, why was Jalen Tome tapped there? I guess he used it at the end of the turn and just forgot yeah, to tap it. I was kind of puzzled why he was tapped with no mana. So they're just going to probably be playing draw go here for a couple turns while they just sculpt their hands. But if I were if I were Sebastian, I would absolutely be killing Jalen Tome right now. I think that with with active Jam Day, the only way your opponent is still in the game is if he has the ability to effectively draw two as well. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised. What do you think about the choice to uh, to play Nettling Imp versus just throwing it away with Jalem Tome, just given the way the board state is? Yeah, I was thinking about that as well. He can, of course, use the Imp to force uh, Sebastian's creature to attack, but then he can... doesn't really matter that much. Yeah, I feel like I feel like from Julian's perspective, I feel like Swamps right now are actually a lot more valuable than 1-1 one -one creatures because... Um, I mean, I guess you're right. He can he can effectively cause the Knights of Thorn to attack with the Nettling Imp. That does, I guess, give him an answer to to uh, Sebastian's creatures for a while because he has that enormous Frozen Shade. So that that does, in fact, make sense. It'll be interesting to see if he uses it here. And of course, yeah. And then Sebastian is forced right to make a difficult decision. Use the Mace to get his Knight back. Oh, there's an yeah, Sarah Angel. Angel coming down. I mean, with Jam Day Tom running, there's just it's inevitable what's going to happen here. He's just going to overwhelm a threat. So, yeah, there's the play we expected. He's sending the uh, Knights of Thorn in to attack. And you're right. Does he maze his creature here or just let it die? To get it into safety. Yeah, this looks like a block is being declared on the Knights of Thorn right now. You can see him tapping mana. So he could choose to maze here. And, in fact, that would give him an untapped Knights of Thorn that could band with the Sarah Angel to take down the big... Yeah, so he is going to do this. Because he now he doesn't have to worry yeah. about a counterattack from the shade because of banding. Um, if if uh, Julian were to pump all of his mana into his shade, and this is yet another reason to to keep uh, swamps possible. Um, and he's actually throwing a swamp away here. Yeah, he's got. A, but I mean, I think he's he may have multiple swamps in hand. It's hard to know. But if he um, if he sends that frozen shade in, it needs to be bigger than six because. Julie, uh, Sebastian can just ban the two creatures together and assign all of the damage to the Knights of Thorn, leaving the Sarah up and killing the uh, much bigger creature. So Julian exactly. needs, yeah, Julian Basically. needs enough. He needs enough swamps here to be able to uh, to be able to pump the shade up above six health, and he currently can get it to six. He needs to get one more swamp down so that it can be a seven, and that will allow him to actually attack. And again, I mean, I've, I've seen it before with Sarah Angel, that ability that it doesn't have to tap on attacks is just so good in old school. Yeah, isn't it crazy that Vigilance, you think about all the upgrades that Sarah Angel's gotten over the years, you know, all the way up to things like Bane, yeah. Bane Slayer Angel. And, and yet, in old school format, the Vigilance on that creature is so relevant so often. It's really remarkable. Okay, the IO pile yeah. could be useful in kind of a banding blocking situation that you just discussed. Yep. And of course, well, of course, with the IO pile, he can just kill the knights. Yeah, you can just kill the knights. He may just be looking, but he, I mean, he has an he has a way to kill the knights right now just through nettling imp. So having IO pile gives him it now actually allows him to attack with the frozen shade because if if um, even without as much mana as we discussed, because if Sebastian d blocks and bans, he can just kill the knights of thorn with the IO pile and then assign all the damage to the Sarah because there's no longer banding. So he's doing this play again just to keep the maze busy. It's a very intricate and cool board state right now, actually. Um, unfortunately, one guy has a jam day tone. 
Yeah, and that's that's why Sebastian has the uh, how do you say the, the better end of the stick? Yes, definitely the better end of the stick. I think that uh, usually it's known as the short end of the stick, but in this case, it's, uh, it's, short end. it's okay. the better end. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> most stick, most sticks have a better end. They're not normally all. They're not usually symmetric on both sides. All right, let's see what he's doing here. Three black mana. This looks like the same block. Blocking the Knights of Thorn. I don't think they're banded together. The Sarah's not attacking a bandit separate, so he is going to maze his guy again and hit uh, hit Julian for four. So we'll see him drop to Sorry. 11. When you're Sebastian, you're like, okay, this is fine. I'm, I'm dealing four damage. I'm going to draw an extra card with my Tome. Um, I think the only thing you're not happy about is, is the attack that's coming from the Frozen Shade, right? Yeah, I mean, there is now a counterattack. He does have the uh, Chaos Orb, and we know that he doesn't have Swords to Plowshares, but really... Um, uh, Black Knight. Okay, so that's that's going to definitely complicate things. Although, still, um, with the ability to remove the Bander at instant speed with Ale Pile, I think he should he can still attack with the Frozen Shade. Unfortunately, he's thrown away a lot of swamps, so the Frozen Shade is not as big as it should be, or as big as it could be. But it's he's obviously in a tough dilemma, right? He he needs something that's a little oh, bit more man. impactful than just attacking for one. He is taking four damage a turn here. And Julian, and Julian's definitely in a pretty powerful position. And, and of course, the Chaos Orb is just always looming. It's always just sitting there waiting to uh, disrupt things if need be. Yeah, Sebastian, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I find yeah, it so Sebastian annoying man. playing against an opponent with a Chaos Orb on the table. God, yeah, it is it, it is nightmarish having to just contend with the card because of... And obviously, it has that very, very small random element where sometimes it doesn't actually do what it's supposed to, right? Sometimes you, you miss with it, too. And so to, to spend half the game grinding your teeth and uh and trying to figure out a way to deal with chaos orb and then when it finally gets activated and they miss <laughs> it's so anticlimactic and strange because you've you've kind of contended with a particular reality and then it's just gone okay so oh, interesting mind twist for two mind twist, mind twist. yeah i mean so I, i'm forcing Estian's hand here yeah this looks like divine offering coming maybe yeah so that's got to obviously take down the jail and tome and with that i i, I imagine that uh that Julian's chances in this game fall to practically zero. I just don't understand how he can, how he can keep up without uh, without the ability to at least cycle a card per turn, and that gains two life for Sebastian as well. Pretty awkward spot. But it's so interesting because I guess Sebastian is not valuing the tome uh, as highly as we do. Because if I would have had that divine offering in hand, I would have used it. Yeah, uh, it's it's possibly he just drew it, perhaps. he drew it just that turn. Although he did, I, I do think he probably drew Black Knight, right? Because he and there goes Hell's Caretaker. Hell's um, Caretaker. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I I, I guess he, uh, he he figures there's there's probably just something a little bit more dangerous in the deck to deal with. We know that um, Julian doesn't have a Jam Day Tome though. He does have Disrupting Scepter, which he did have in hand right there. But either way, uh, either way, Sebastian in a completely commanding position now. Just a Sarah coming over, over and over and over again. Yeah, I'm trying to think what could kind of you know, save Julian here. Maybe a Pestilence. Let's go take a look. Yeah, well, Underworld Dreams would be pretty powerful. He doesn't, I guess he does have the Chaos Orb to get rid of it. But he's really running short on answers. He does have his own Chaos Orb to take down the Sarah. He has Drain Life that could kill the Sarah Angel. Um, Nightmare wouldn't be too bad. I think it would be a 4-4 four, four, or 5-5 five, five right now. And uh, potentially Dust to Dust, actually. Dust to Dust would be pretty strong. Oh, man. Oh, Taunus' yeah. Coffin. That is but, going to make things even more complicated. Yeah. I think this first game is pretty much over, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. So right now, do you think Sebastian is... Uh, oh, it looks like... Okay, it looks like he just, just came over with the Sarah Angel and hit for four there. No reason to attack on the ground into a drudge skeleton. Yeah, that's one nice thing. It's neat to see actually how effective drudge skeleton becomes when uh, bands are involved. Because normally <laughs> banding creatures are, uh, are very, very problematic because they kind of fuse together and create a creature that's enormous. But the one downside to banding, of course, is that um, if you're able to block just one of the creatures in the band, the entire band is stopped. So a single regenerator provided that something in the band doesn't have, I don't know, like the flanking ability or something. A single tiny little regenerator can stop an enormous band of creatures as long as there's no trample. And of course, that's when it gets really, really complicated when you've got banding and trampling going on. 
Yeah, is that is that something? Because I've had that discussion before. You, you know the card Banala Shiro, right? One white, one one with banding. Yes. And if if it's used to block a force of nature, can it then take all the damage? So there's no trample damage going. Yeah, to and the... this is this is another one of the reasons why I think banding was was done away with as a mechanic. Uh, it cannot. You can only assign the way that trample works is you can only assign trample damage equal to the toughness of the creature that's that's blocking it and all excess is carried over. So even if you have a band with uh, Banalish Hero mm -hmm. and something else, you can only assign up to one point of damage onto the Banalish Hero and then up to the max toughness of whatever else is in the band. However, if you had, let's say, let's say you had something like um, Sebastian's board state where you had a four, a two, a two, maybe the veteran bodyguard and a Banalish Hero or something, or actually just the Knights of Thorn having banding would be enough. You could put three on the Sarah, four on the veteran bodyguard, one on the knight, one on the knight, and absorb all of it. What it kind of meant is, isn't banding a static ability? Um, that it's always there? Yes. So doesn't then the Benelli Shiro have the ability to say, okay, I'm going to divide all the damage over to me, even if it's a single blocker? No, because you can't assign more than one point of trample to a creature that only has yeah. one health. You just simply can't do it. Okay, it makes sense. Yeah. And let's see what is Sebastian doing now. He's... Yeah, he's thinking, thinking about attacking in a band here. So these two guys are both coming over in a band, and the Sarah is attacking separately, it looks like. And he's got Taunus's coffin here anyway. He could just, uh, he could just Taunus his coffin, the, uh, the frozen shade, if he wanted to. But that would, that would make his Sarah vulnerable and, and make him potentially vulnerable to a card like Ashes to Ashes. The problem is, is that um, if, if Julian gets too low, then Ashes to Ashes isn't going to work because it deals five damage to you. I'm I think looking. if if I were Sebastian right now, I would just attack with a four four flyer and pass turn. Yeah, not even screw around with the two the two banders. Yeah. Or he's got the, the, the skeleton. He's got the IO pile. He's got you know. Yeah, and the desert as well. And, so and, just, really and just a big beefy guy on defense. I kind of agree. I think that just attacking with the Sarah and keeping all of your resources available as well as your blockers is probably the best plan. He also he just played a factory too, so he's even got an extra guy on defense. But looks like looks like they're both attacking. Well, keep in mind that the the Knights of Thorn was nettled, so it has to attack. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. I kind of missed that part. Now I understand. Yeah, that makes more sense. All right, so we saw an ale pile used on the Black Knight. Yeah, he probably is going to use the order. Uh, oh no, he's yeah. So I think shade. I'm not really sure what. Why he? It's hard for us because we don't know what uh, they're speaking, obviously in French, and we can't hear them anyway. But um, they were. Uh, I think that I, I expect that the two knights were banded together, and that's why he just elected to use Aelpal, which just let the uh, Knights of Thorn come in. But he had enough mana to just block with the Frozen Shade and, and pump it up. Plus, he's got a pro white Order of the Ebon Hand there, and the the Order of the Ebon Hand can just block the uh, the Knights of Thorn by itself. And then we saw at the end, we saw Sebastian using the maze to take the uh, the knight out of the combat. Yeah. And look, there's just Juggernaut comes down, but it's it's definitely, it's too late for the Juggernaut at this point. There's just an army of stuff. And in fact, um, yeah, I guess Sebastian doesn't have uh, Desert in play. Does he have Desert in his deck? There's no way he's got it, right? He's, he's running his crazy I, mana base. Oh, this is interesting. No, Putting it uh, in the box here. The order of the Ebon Hand. Oh, interesting. So he, yeah, that's because now he wants to get through with his. Uh, oh, ashes to ashes. Ashes to ashes, just as we said, and he's got life left to cast it too. That's a huge, huge play. Wow. Really surprised to see that. And ashes to ashes is it's instant, right? I think it's sorcery. Is it sorcery? To be what was the I timing there? Let me check here. Ashes to ashes. But this has changed. It is, yes, it is sorcery. So how exactly did that happen? So he must have announced an attack. Sebastian threw the Order of the Ebon Hand into the, into the, uh, into the... Yeah, and then in his second main into phase. the I coffin, right. And then that gave uh, Julian an opportunity to use the Ashes to Ashes in his hand. I think that that was absolutely a, uh, a misplay from, from Sebastian there. I think that there's no reason to do that. He's got 17 life... And it's a pump. It's a pump night, right? So if you're going to cough in it, do it at least after the guy's invested in invested a bunch of mana in his guy. 
Uh, and then he wouldn't have had enough mana anymore to play the Ashes to Ashes. Right, exactly. And if he pumps it, I mean, at, at the worst, you take two damage. And it's strange to me that he would do that because he had, he, he showed a lot of discipline as far as taking damage early in order to, to cement his position when he was getting attacked by the factory. And yet here he just used the, the Taunus's coffin. <laughs> He could have used the coffin, of course, to save his Sarah Angel. Right, to save his Sarah might. Angel, exactly. And he would have, yeah. uh, he'd be attacking for four more damage here, and his opponent would have no way to deal with it. Instead, I mean, he does have a pro black creature, which is. He's very strong in this uh, situation. Yeah, pretty nightmarish to deal with a pro black creature anyway. It really leaves his opponent with few outs because he used the Ayla Pile to kill off the black knight. And if Sebastian would have kept his Tonsus coffin untapped to save his Sarah, oh no, then he wouldn't have won yet because it comes back. Yeah, untapped. it comes back and it gets summoning sickness again, but. Yeah, with the with the white knight in play, there really aren't too many there aren't too many outs left for. Uh, does Julian have anything left now that his artifact creature is gone? And that's why, of course, he used Tonsus Coffin on Juggernaut so he could get that that two damage in. Yeah, yeah I'm looking make... at I'm looking at Sebastian's list, and I noticed actually that he's running White Knight and he's not running Order of Leapbor. <laughs> Interesting. That's quite puzzling. Yeah. I guess he's concerned by the one health on it. I'm just looking for potential outs here. It doesn't look like there's anything really. Um, well, of course, with 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 a, with a trike that you see a lot in this format. Yep, yeah. but there's no Triskelion, no Triskelion in Julian's deck, and Underworld Dreams a day late and a dollar short. There's no answer to the uh, White Knight, and that'll be the end of the first game. Welcome at game number two here between Sebastian, who's sitting on the left, against Julian. So Sebastian here won the first game. I'm still here with Brian Weissman. Welcome. Hey, guys. Glad to be back. Looks like we've got it. Who is... Do you think that Julian is just going to... Or Sebastian is just going to make it a 2-0? Um, I mean, based on the way the last game played out, I, I really think that Sebastian is heavily favored if he draws mana. That's really what it's going to come down to. If you look right now, he's actually in the process of mulliganing, uh, which I think he probably has done a fair number of times, given the fact that he's running his deck on only 20 land and uh, has a lot of spells at my count, I think 15 total that have either a double black or double white color requirement. So, um, but with that, with that uh, decision comes <clears throat> great reward if in fact he's able to draw mana because his deck is extremely spell dense. So you can mulligan down to six or even five, provided you draw mana, you're probably still going to outdraw your opponent uh, in terms of impactful spells. <laughs> Looks like we have another, we had another impromptu guest there. Um, if you, uh, if you're able to actually draw sufficient mana, okay, he's mulliganing a second time. So wow. down to five cards here. Again, this is just the risk you take with uh, running 20 land. I mean, I, I think traditionally, if you look at decks that people have, um, have run 20 lands and they tend to be decks that run uh, an average com converted mana cost of something in the neighborhood of probably 1.5 or so if you look if you take all the spells and you add them up together and then divide by the when number I, of spells when i think about those type of decks i always think about like oromono red deck you know just with chain lightning lightning bolt goblins or whatever maybe yeah. cobalt and or or a mono green deck with a, with like lana elves and stompy or something yeah maybe mono white also you know you can run the the old, the, white the old, yeah, the old school. Well, they were called, uh, you know, just Type One back in the day, but um, they were pretty successful running lots of one drops, Acacian Javelinaires, Order of Leap, um, not Order of Leap, or uh, Savannah Lions, and uh, things like Mesa Pegasus, Order of Leap, or White Knight, and then the Shadow Creatures eventually showed up. And those white, those white weenie decks tended to run about twenty twenty one land. Sometimes they'd run land tax. The one benefit, at least, is that you get to mulligan. Uh, you get to mulligan to seven over and over again, and of course, that's the, the London mulligan, as it's called, is a, a relatively new invention. I, I, I legitimately do not think you could ever, ever attempt to run a deck with the mana base that uh, Sebastian's deck has before the London mulligan existed, because having to redraw to five cards and uh, and running a deck with only twenty land in it, the chances that you have sufficient mana are practically zero. He at least is. Has the advantage of being on the play, uh, on the draw here, and uh, his opponent's deck is quite slow, so he's not going to be punished for a slow start. In a way, it surprises me that Julian's deck is is, is quite slow because he's playing mono black, so he, he he could play a bit more aggressive. But you can already see with the Willow in turn one, at least this is some aggression, right? With the with the Black Knight. Yeah, no, I do I do agree. Oh, oh my God, like perfect hard counter from the uh, White Black deck and uh, White <laughs> nice. Knight. Although it doesn't, those two knights will pass each other in the night, as we used to say, but. Um, yeah, the uh, th I actually tried to build mono black for uh, the old school singleton format when I was doing my initial testing when I first learned about the format, and after putting together black, I kind of concluded that um, 
there just there just aren't enough good cards in black to really make the archetype work as an aggressive deck. You have to play it defensively. You have to as play a, it. Oh, really? So as a singleton? Yeah. As a, they're just if if you look at what's available, there's some there's some decent creatures in Arabian Nights that actually introduced a few beaters. There's Hasran Ogris. There's uh, yeah, Ur, Ur, Ur Raiders. Raiders. Yeah, I mean those and those things are decent, but they're relatively weak creatures stacked up against some of the stuff that's just an alpha and. You're often just stuck in a situation where you're drawing these seemingly bad creatures and your opponent has something really obnoxious like a wall of swords in play or a wall of brambles. Just some two, three yeah. wall that you just can't get through and you've got these really janky creatures that deal damage to you and you try to attack. And it just doesn't it just doesn't work out in the long run. I don't think it's really the, the best way to play black. I mean, I think mono black, look at I mean, you want to talk about a good start though. Holy moly. Yeah, he's um, having a great start. Yeah, I mean, if Sebastian doesn't Sebastian doesn't. Oh, by the way, he's deciding not to use the scepter here, but play another creature. I, I I totally agree with that. I think that that's perfect. Um, he his opponent has a white knight in play. His opponent is is stumbled on man is double mulliganed. I think that messing with your opponent's hand in lieu of putting pressure on the board doesn't make any sense. I think with a shaky mana base like this, I mean, he can he can hit for six three times, and the game's just instantly over here. Um, and in fact, I probably wouldn't develop the board any further. I think I would just hit for six and pump his uh, his order of the ebon hand. We'll see if he does it. So he's dealing four damage. Okay, so you, you wouldn't even use the scepter. Yeah, well, we'll see if he's just going to... Okay, well, sinkhole's uh, perfect. Sinkhole. Yeah, that's great. I mean, obviously, uh, so if Sebastian has any outs at all against these these pro-black creatures, or pro-white creatures, it's going to be with black mana. So the sinkhole makes perfect sense. I don't understand why he wouldn't uh, why he wouldn't pump the order Yeah, why would you pump? Maybe he has something in his hand that he wants to respond to a possible play. Like a terror, perhaps, if he plays a creature. Although you can do it and later as well. Yeah, yeah you can do it later. And I, I mean, maybe just regenerating the will of the wisp but I think the extra point of damage is, is extremely important. Sebastian, completely cut off from a color here due to the double mulligan and the sinkhole, is going to be dead here really quickly. And I would be shocked if, uh, if Julian didn't just pump his order next turn to deal six. To give Sebastian one more turn, even if he has Swords of Plashers, he can't even, uh, can't kill anything of consequence with it. And Wrath of God is two turns away. Yeah, true. That's minimum. four, of course. Yeah. Balance. Okay, this is something. Yeah. Well, this is yet an this is yet another reason to uh, to pump the order just to get more damage in for for a card like Balance. Um, but obviously, he, he should sack. Well, Will o Wisp and um, Will o Wisp and Black Knight, of course, leave the order yeah, in play. Order, it's the order you can still pump. Yeah. Looks like he's doubting, though. Does he have to there can't, cut down it, his hand size? No. Yeah, this no. this can't even be a, a a choice, honestly. I mean, he he doesn't have to discard the hand size. Uh, Sebastian's hand is quite bigger, so <laughs> ironically, after a double mulligan. Yeah, that's the one out he could have had, I and suppose. I think, yeah, I was just thinking a little bit, because we looked earlier at Sebastian's list, and, and you already said it, it surprised you that you saw a White Knight over an Order of Liper. Yeah, and that's it, of course. a really, really puzzling choice to me. I don't understand why he would... Uh, yeah, look at all these double black cards going to the graveyard. That's, I think wow. that's Gate to Phyrexia and Kumbaj Witches. Um, and the fact that he... It's interesting, they're talking about this, the Order of Resolution here. So the fact that he's discarding Kumbaj Witches makes the decision to keep the Order even even better. I mean, I think I would do it anyway, given that he has no black mana, but Kumbash Witches is actually a pinger and is black, so it's a way to kill Order of uh, order of the Ebon Hand. Yeah, it can actually be really, really strong against uh, Julian's deck, but hey, it's gone now. Yeah. It's a double black now. So I think he just attacks and pumps here. He missed one damage last turn. Probably won't be of tremendous consequence as that's three hits, and the Order will definitely outrun the White Knight. There's two more damage coming through. Like oh, we have a visitor. You've got another <laughs> guest. Oh, look at that. What a oh, draw. Oh, this is a blocker. It is a blocker unless he draws one more swamp. Well, it cannot pump itself yet. Of right, right, right. But even, itself if, two, two. even if he has even a swamp, um, even if he has a swamp, I'm sorry, even if it is able to pump itself, the order by nature of being a pump knight with first strike can actually get through that and become a 3-1. So still attacking here. Uh, just two more turns to go. He does. He does at least have a chump blocker. So there are probably some outs here. If he could get another land and cast, say, icy manipulator, or something to stop the order. Yeah he, he, yeah, he needs something. Yeah, we'll see if he plays anything. I don't agree with the decision not to attack with the factory there, though. I think he should attack with the factory, given that he's uh, he's almost certainly not going to just be chump blocking with one of his three lands to stop the knight. Not this, he, not, not, now, on, not on this turn, at least. He's, he's on six. He's going to drop to two. Yeah, but right? I, yeah, but oh, what? Okay. What are you doing? Oh, mind twist for three. Okay. Twist. 
Yeah. <laughs> another mm -hmm. another double black and a guardian beast. Uh, can't say I agree with that. I think he should have. What? No. What are you doing? What? Oh, he's trading now. Oh, my. Oh, no, he's oh, not even God. trading, of course. He can't pump. He can't. Oh, oh. oh, my goodness. Did we just see this that This is happen? a huge misplay. Like, he had the game in the bag, and now it's it's gone. It's over. Unreal. I mean, unless he needs to draw something that's... He needs to draw a disc, I guess. Does he have Nibinarol's disc in his deck? What happened? Uh, well, I mean, we know what happened, but he, I mean, he had it in the bag. Yeah, I'm just looking at his list there. No, I don't want to cut away from the action here. Oh, he does have disc. Ooh, okay, okay, But the okay. disc doesn't stop wow. the factory. He's going, be at, he's going to be at two, so he needs to not only stop the disc, or he needs to not only... Uh, yeah, he's going to have to disc during the attack step here. Uh, and obviously, Sebastian won't be sending his uh, his factory in here. No, and it, so it's still a problem for for Julian. Yeah, I mean, I guess he should just scepter him here and pass and use the disc to kill the black the white knight during the attack step, and then untap and hopefully play a creature or something that can stop Misha's factory. Wow. He yeah. was just so focused on that mind twist play that he just forgot all about the uh, the factory. I guess. Yeah, total just total oversight. And, and will probably be decisive here. I mean, the game was basically over. All he had to do was just attack with order they have in hand there before playing before uh, playing his mind twist. And uh, yeah, let Sebastian block. It doesn't really change anything. Otherwise, you hit, you hit for damage, and then you cast mind twist. All right, so the disc takes away the white knight. And he didn't even use the scepter. And he did not scepter. use the scepter for... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine he's just flustered here. You got to understand it. You know, in old school singleton format... The, uh, whoa, that whoa, was strip mine, that was a draw. Mine. He's got strip mine. All right, so he's not dead to that, but he's all right. He's shifting in his whoa. chair. You can look at his body language. That, that was comfortable. He feels comfortable again, which makes me think that he's probably got some kind of removal in his hand. Probably terror. Let's wow, see what happens here? And Sebastian has no play. Life total is currently at two to six. There's a gate to Phyrexia, but that's not going to change anything. At least that does give him some some way to stop a tome. You notice this late in the game, there was obviously a sinkhole, but Sebastian still does not have double black in play. And we're what on turn 12 or something. Yeah, I, I think we are. That's true. Still no double black. And I, I yeah, probably he, have some cards in hand. Yeah. He did sinkhole him. God, I, 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 you can only wonder what would have happened if he sceptered him there. What, what that card was another white mana source. Okay. I just saw drain life actually in, uh, in, Julian's hand right where it is he uh, tipped his hand towards the camera so we oh, know really? he at least has drain life yeah so if something like a Sarah comes down or oh going, trike that's, trike that's game that is the game oh man this is just ridiculous yeah well, on, pretty right pretty disappointing conclusion to a game that really should have been Julian's there's just literally nothing that uh nothing that he can do at instant speed to save himself here no it no shows, here you shows go the drain again. life but yeah of course he's not going to play that on the the one the chance that Sebastian has basically his one source of direct damage. He doesn't, I don't believe he's running Illipile. I can go look real quick here. Yeah, so you... So you oh, no, he, do, he does have Illipile. So that was, that was another thing to consider, um, the fact that he was at two and his opponent had both Triskelion and, and Illipile in his deck. I, I, don't think that, I don't think that Julian was probably giving a lot of thought to what kind of outs Sebastian might have had there. He probably was still just steaming from the, uh, the Order of the Ebon Hand attack. But I think in his position, I probably would have, assuming that he has another removal spell in his hand, and I think he probably does, um, I would have probably just used the uh, the drain life right there to get out of range from dying to something like that. Then again, um, if all he I'm has is terror, he decides so to... I'm just surprised that, that Sebastian won this one. It's just... Yeah, a little disappointing to see double mulligan into. Uh, I mean, he did have the balance, which which stemmed, stopped the bleeding a lot. But when your opponent just basically throws away a what would have been a 4-1 first striker with pro-white and all you have is white land in play, it's pretty hard to uh, lose the game from that position. I'm sure they're discussing it. I'm sure Julian will be thinking ahead to uh, future games in uh, future events when he can be a little bit more careful about not running. Yeah, exactly. and, and, and in Julian's defense, I do recognize that when you, you make a play mistake and you realize it, it's, it's kind of tough to bounce back. You know what I mean? Like it's still in the back of your head. Yep. Oh, wait, it, it absolutely is. It's a kind of, I've, I've seen it so many times in, um, in even very, very, very high level competition, even at pro level competition where players will make one mistake, get flustered and rattled, and it will just snowball into error after error after error. And before you know it, they've thrown away a game that they, they literally couldn't lose before. 
kind of like this game actually, but um, it's interesting to see some high drama. And uh, that's it. Sebastian wow, wins man. this match 2-0. This is a quarterfinal game, and hopefully we've got some more games down the road. Uh, if we can get some good audio or good media files that we can use. This one was quite a bear to navigate, but we got through it. And I, uh, I really enjoyed doing the commentary with you. Yeah, thank you. It was a joy. It was um, nice to do it together. And yeah, maybe we can do some live tournaments in the future. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Yep, sounds great. Thanks so much for your, uh, for your time and uh, see you guys soon. And that was it for now. Oh my, my, my. What an interesting game number two. And uh, I really sympathize here towards uh, Julian. Like, I understand you got that mind twist. You want to just empty that hand, make sure you know, you're already winning, but you, that your opponent is completely down. Uh, and then, yeah, after that, you kind of forget, oh yeah, the factory can pump itself. And uh, yeah, this has happened to me as well. So I can really sympathize. I want to thank uh, Sebastian and Julian for uh, sharing their game with us and letting us commentate. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank Brian uh, for joining me in the commentary booth. Although we're not sitting in a booth, but it sounds more professional if I say booth sitting in the booth I like I like sounds cool um, anyway I would also like to thank uh, Thomas uh, Ribe and of course uh, Mikael for uh, lay, uh, for asking us to do this together it's uh, it's been a fun project uh, this has been episode number two let me know in the comments below if you enjoy this content and who knows maybe there is more to come in the future uh, talking about the future I would like to thank you for uh, watching another episode right here at Timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic and um, if you'd like to support me if you'd like to support what i do and support the old school magic content uh, you can simply click the like button that already helps a lot also you can leave a comment um, you can become a subscriber if you're not a sub yet share this video on your socials and also click that notification bell so that you will be notified as soon as I upload new content. What you can also do is you can support the channel by becoming a patron and you can do that via the Timmy Talks Patreon page. There's probably a link popping up right now. Click on that link that will take you to Timmy Talks Patreon and you can already support what I do for $1 a month. Talking about supporters, let's take a look at the end scroll and see who are the fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Just think it is Samba Kazik!